Light. So, uh, Joseph Halliday, one of the first year ID fellows here at USF. Uh, when I talk about mycobacterium abscessus and solid organ transplant recipients, uh, I chose this topic uh, because while in service, on immunocompromised service, we had a number of these cases come up, and so this is uh, uh, kind of what I found in reviewing the subject. As far as the objectives, uh, it would be basically, first off, like a review of a uh, current or recent literature regarding epidemiology of uh, mycobacterium abscessus and solid organ transplant. I'll also go over the diagnosis of uh, M. abscessus, treatment options, uh, and considerations, particularly in organ transplant recipients, and uh, another uh, review of recent literature as far as some of the outcome studies or reviews that have been done particularly to M. abscessus. Um, thought we'd first start off with the case. This is a patient that we saw here at USF. It's a 47-year-old male with a history of bilateral lung transplant, 2005, secondary to pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, recently had, a, had mycobacterium abscessus recovered on a routine uh, BAL. Uh, within the last year, he'd been treated for parainfluenza 3 pneumonia as well as uh, been on voriconazole for aspergillus pneumonia. His immunosuppression regimen consisted of cyclosporin, mycophenolate, and prednisone at 5 milligrams daily. Uh, and he's also on uh, PO azithromycin for bronchiolitis obliterans prophylaxis. Um, clinically, you know, despite treatment for his recent aspergillus, uh, his functional status and FEV1 have been declining to the point of consideration for retransplant, so we asked to see the patient. Um, so we'll start off just with a little bit of background on uh, M. abscessus. Uh, certainly it's a uh, non-tuberculous mycobacteria falls into that large group. Um, it is a rapid grower, um, along with uh, mycobacterium chelonian fortuitum, rounds out the three. Um, subspecies include abscessus, Mastilians and Boletii, although the last two may be hard to distinguish from each other. Um, it's unfortunately deleted, but uh, it became separate from the Mycobacterium chelonii complex in 1992. Before that, it was hard to do. really wasn't anything. It really wasn't its own uh, class. Um, and the full genome was sequenced in 2000, just in 2009. Some risk factors uh, particular to uh, organ transplant recipients uh, would be the uh, deficient cell mediated and innate, innate immunity. Um, and then like with all uh, infections or opportunistic infections in uh, organ transplant patients who consider the net state of immunosuppression, which is usually determined by the dose duration and sequence of the immunosuppression medications. Um, and also in the post-transplant period, you need to consider a disruption of the mucocutaneous barriers like surgical site or at the anastomosis as well as structural abnormalities and even underlying chronic disease uh, separate from the reason they're getting transplant. Um, and unlike other opportunistic infections in this group, uh, most reviews haven't shown any kind of predictable time period. The one I referenced was anywhere between 2 and 240 months, although some as early as a few weeks I've seen. Um, generally it's a rare pathogen and uh, don't see it too too often necessarily even in non-immunosuppressed, but um, it is ubiquitous in nature, in soil, plants, and water, uh, particularly drinking water, um, showers, hospital distribution systems is possible to get contaminated or colonized with. Um, but generally, the true incidence of any non tuberculous mycobacteria is in organ transplant is not really known and largely based on case series and case reports, but uh, it does seem that. Uh, lung transplant uh, has the most 
uh, reported cases of M abscesses. Um, one large case review as far as the prevalence in organ transplant was done in published in CID in 2004 and it was done by people at Harvard but they reviewed all of the literature available from like the 19 60s or 70s up until that time and found 276 cases um, and as part of those cases M abscesses was an identified six times out of 22 lung transplant infections with MTM three in kidney they didn't see any in heart transplant and one in liver transplant but keep in mind probably a number of those it's probably underreported because of that change in 1992 with the from Chaloni Um, another review of uh, M abscesses, which was or a specific review of M abscesses and solid organ transplant, where they reviewed three cases and did a retrospective review as well. Uh, they found 25 cases of M abscesses from '92 to 2008, and the majority were in lung transplant recipients. A few kidney, one heart, and one in a multi vessel that they ended up publishing. Um, uh, another one done most recently, 2010, uh, I think this one was in Spain actually, but they reviewed all cases from 97 to 2009. They found 76 cases where they, and they went ahead and kind of determined, or tried to determine which ones were actually causing disease and found that by criteria, they used IDSA criteria, and that 30 out of the 76 was actual disease. Um, only seven of them were an organ transplant, the other were in uh, actually non-immunosuppressed patients. Because they just went ahead and reviewed all of all of the cases of abscesses, whether they're immunosuppressed or not, and then from that took data on whether they had history of transplant or other immunosuppressing things. And, so again, uh, most of them were in lung transplant, four out of the seven. Um, and like in uh, other studies, usually it was in clinically at, at serious skin soft tissue infections with dissemination. Uh, uh, one thing to consider because of uh, the number of cystic fibrosis patients that go on to have need lung transplants is that M abscesses is, uh, has an increasing prevalence in that population and there have been studies that have shown that there's a faster decline in lung function uh, compared to other non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections. Um, and most of the time, uh, or commonly, they're co-infected with something, another infection, Aspergillus pseudomonas, probably most, most commonly is reported in one review. Um, it's also uh, reported in outbreaks, usually with hospital water supplies. Can it also contaminated instruments, bronchoscopes, other things that you could use to in invade your patient? Um, and there was a recent report of possible person-to-person -person transmission in an outbreak in a cystic fibrosis and lung transplant clinic, although it's probably... Uh, indirect person-to-person -person transmission, but it's the first one that may be something to consider. Um, clinical manifestations, uh, the most common ones in organ transplant with non-tuberculous mycobacterial infections are pulmonary, skin soft tissue, musculoskeletal, uh, disseminated bacteremic and catheter associated lymphadenitis. Dissemination is more common with abscesses, chelone, and kansasii. Um, and some studies have shown that uh, dissemination is, uh, can be as high as almost 50% in lung transplant recipients with uh, NTM infections. Particular to M abscesses, um, the two most common are pulmonary and skin soft tissue deep musculoskeletal infections. Um, 
most commonly the pulmonary and lung transplant or patients that also have an underlying concomitant disease like bronchiectasis or something like that. Um, as far as the skin findings, they usually have painful subcutaneous nodules. Um, they can pop up on the extremities but also in the surgical site and if they do that most reports are associated with deep complex infections and dissemination is common with an abscessus as I previously mentioned. Um, this is just a table of uh, one of the, the reviews that I, I talked about earlier in which the 19 lung transplant infections, most of them were, were pleuropulmonary in the top right, um, followed by dissemination, cutaneous, and another uh, type of infection. But that's just a picture of some of the typical appearance of the skin nodules you may see on the extremities. And CT scan showing multiple pulmonary nodules, bronchiectasis, and kind of diffusely. Um, as far as diagnosis, it uh, should be suspected when AFB growth is within seven days or less as with the rapid growing mycobacteria, um, or anytime you recover it from a normally sterile site, like blunt a skin nodule that's biopsied or bone or joint. Um, when it's recovered from a lung or pulmonary specimen, then uh, it's kind of our job to help decipher infection versus colonization, which the IDSA guidelines, which were updated in 2007, help us with. Um, although they don't have any particular recommendations for organ transplant patients, it's probably uh, the best thing we have is it's to uh, uh, use that as well in the same population. Um, just one quick thing here, there was a, uh, as far as in the, uh, a big issue in lung transplant patients is if, uh, if they have M. abscessus colonization versus infection, you know, does that imply that there'll be uh, worse outcomes after transplant or should they not be transplanted? Um, this one particular aimed to see if there was a uh, difference in outcomes, whether they had uh, colonization or disease. They found that it was more likely that in this cohort, which was just at a single uh, uh, institution was tenfold higher than versus disease and that there wasn't a survival difference between the colonized who uh, were treated and those who never had MTM isolated. Um, and that was for uh, any, any type of non-tuberculous mycobacteria. For M. abscessus, they found five of them had M. abscessus. Uh, none of them met criteria for pulmonary disease, so it's hard to say if the outcomes necessarily were worse for that, but um, of the five, three of them did develop surgical site infections when I disseminated disease. So it's still pretty virulent organism if it is obtained. This is just a table kind of outlining the diagnostic criteria for uh, NTM lung disease. Um, you need to have clinical and microbiologic uh, meet both criteria to make the diagnosis. They have to have pulmonary symptoms, nodular cavitary opacity, something abnormal in the CAT scan that's not attributed to some other process going on, along with uh, at least either two positive cultures from expected, expectorated sputum or one uh, BAL, or uh, from a lung, from a biopsy specimen showing granulomatous inflammation and one specimen growing uh, the NTM. Uh, as far as treatment goes, these two headlines kind of uh, describe some of the problems we have with treating mycobacterium abscessus. The second one was uh, by Dr. Griffith, who is a colleague of Dr. Wallace, one of the gurus of that non-tuberculous mycobacteria. That was 
re in a recent journal. But. So considerations, you know, you need to think of the type of transplant, site severity of infection, um, certainly drug interactions, toxicity, and uh, treatment based on uh, somewhat based on drug susceptibility testing that's obtained. This is just a list of most of the antibiotic choices that have been deemed to have some in vitro activity against an abscesses. Um, macrolides um, along with amicase and cefoxidin have some of the higher uh, likelihood of uh, susceptible MICs, but other other newer antibiotics like linazolid, tigacycline are also on there, and the uh, difficult to obtain clofazamine, although the studies has sometimes up to 99% susceptibility. Quinolones are also on there, but not used as frequently. Same with doxycycline. Um, treatment options, you know, unlike MTV, none of the uh, ripe medications have any activity against MFSSs. Um, does have multiple mechanisms of resistance. Some are inducible, some acquired, although not all of them are fully elucidated at this point. Um, the most important one, probably at this point, is to know the inducible ribosome methylase gene, the ERM gene, uh, which confers a high level of resistance to macrolides. Um, the subspecies uh, Massiliens, uh is actually intrinsically susceptible to macrolides because it doesn't have or lacks the complete ERM gene, which is something that was recently published. Um, and a study where they were able to specie out, speciate out uh, abscesses from Massilians showed that there was an 88% versus 25% achievement of uh, converted and maintained sputum uh, after treatment with clarithromycin, cefoxidin, and acacin, although that wasn't in transplant patients. And that didn't, they didn't study outcomes as far as complications, death, or anything like that. Um, and one thing about that is that I think every single one of the M. abscessus possess the ERM gene, which it's not suspected that all of them necessarily express it per se. Um, then just go over the current guidelines for treatment. Uh, the IDSA ATS recommends two agents, um, at least two agents, one being a macrolide if it's susceptible. Um, for serious skin soft tissue infections, it's clarithro or azithro plus an injectable agent, either amicacin, cefoxin, or imipenem. Uh, amicase and cefoxin is a popular choice. The combination uh, is generally recommended for at least the first two weeks of these skin infections or until clinical improvement. Um, they make note that macrolides are the only oral agents reliably active in vitro, um, although this was updated before a lot of the subspecies stuff. Um, duration is four months for serious skin soft tissue, six months for uh, osteomyelitis at least, and they recommend to consider surgery for abscess, extensive disease, or when drug therapy is difficult, which may be every case. <laughs> uh, for pulmonary infection, state that no antibiotic regimen has been shown to produce a long-term sputum conversion, so the goal uh, would be to have negative sputum, or at least 12 months of negative sputum cultures while on therapy, but the goals may be more realistic uh, more realistic goals would be symptom improvement or improvement in their imaging. Surgery is recommended if able for localized disease after a lead-in period of antibiotics. This so should be considered. Um, I did look at some of the uh, guidelines, somewhat guidelines from the American Society of Transplantation. They recommend their recommendations are azithromycin plus a uh, similar uh, combination as in the IDSA. Um, they recommend considering three drugs empirically, 
and they consider clarithromycin a second line agent along with tigacycline and linazolid mainly because of its interactions with uh, calcinurin inhibitors and other immunosuppressants but and certainly if able to then to decrease immunosuppression is key if able if you're able um, just some of the uh, interactions that you'd come in contact with and at least the rationale for why azithromycin would be first line over colithro in an organ transplant patient at least that's probably going to be on uh, calcineurin inhibitors is because of inhibition of the cytochrome P450 uh, which is pretty significant with clarithro uh, not as potent with azithro but the levels can still go up even with azithromycin the one main difference would be if the patient's on serolimus then there's actually no known interaction with azithromycin whereas they still have the effect from clarithromycin on there and uh, just some other guidelines considering you may be using amikacin or even a quinolone there are some other interactions especially combined nephrotoxicity with uh, aminoglycosides um, then just a little snippet about tigacycline use because uh, here it seemed to use it frequently for the lung transplant patients that have resistant disease which most of them do um, there was a case report in 2009 had three successfully treated solid organ transplant infections that used tigacycline as part of their regimen which was second line after susceptibility testing was known and one of them actually was treated with monotherapy which is generally not recommended for MFCSS but that was coupled with decreased immunosuppression and uh, none of these patients had pulmonary disease they all had skin soft tissue disease and some of them may not necessarily been as severe as other infections at least with the monotherapy success but it's at least something to consider um, because of its high uh, in vitro studies showing that it can be up to 100% sensitive. Um, as far as some of the outcomes with these patients, if you look at the lung transplant uh, recommendations, they state that any infection with a highly virulent or resistant organism is a relative contraindication. Um, MMSSS probably falls into that, although apparently some transplant centers will exclude patients based on the infection with MMSSS, particularly because of how virulent it is um, and there was a study in 2011 showing that in colonization with any non-tuberculous mycobacteria or disease had an increased mortality uh, after transplant a hazard ratio of 2.6 and MAC was more common than abscesses but in the, the patients that had clinical disease it was about the same as MAC um, Another study trying to gain more uh, traction as far as lung transplant patients, particularly with cystic fibrosis, uh, that can still get transplanted with NTM disease. They had 53 patients in their review. Um, the two that had serious infections after transplant were skin infections, wound infections, and it was MFSSs. They noted that two died, but they couldn't provide a direct link per se to the infection. Um, and this this article that was published just this year is actually probably the most pertinent to our debate that I presented in the beginning. Um, and this was also in lung transplant cystic fibrosis uh, that had preoperative. Uh, respiratory infection with M abscesses. They they had about they had 13 patients, which they compared to 154 patients that also were transplanted in the same period of time as far as their outcomes. Um, 11 of the 13 in this group were uh, cleared in parentheses, which was defined by a negative culture tw greater than 12 months. Uh, most of them had a positive AFB at the time of transplant. They were all co-infected with something. Um, 
and they had different uh, regimens used that they were being treated with prior to the transplant, but uh, after transplant, they were all treated with clorithro, cefoxid, and amikacin for at least six weeks, pending a new uh, susceptibility if they did grow M. abscessus in the period after transplant. And in that group, four of them had recurrence, and of those four, only three were treated because of clinical disease, and they were pretty severe infections. Uh, the one mediastinal abscess with bacteremia, they noted, required nine or ten debridements over a year or two, and two other ones with empyema and sternal osteomyelitis also required a number of debridements, and uh, all three ended up uh, uh, dying, but uh, their, uh, the mortality was not deemed to be any different than the uh, lung transplant, cystic fibrosis lung transplant that didn't, did not have prior infection with M. abscesses. Um, so essentially that's about it, just in summary, you know, it's a rare, rare pathogen, uh, most likely to be encountered as far as an organ transplant, a lung transplant more than others. Um, there is some controversy over uh, contraindications, whether it's relative or not, with reports to transplanting these patients uh, that are previously prior co colonized or infected. Um, the optimal treatment regimen is not defined by any means in solid organ transplant patients, but decreasing the immunosuppression, surgery if possible should always be considered as in non-transplant patients. And uh, as far as choice of therapy, the drug-drug interactions and toxicities are one of the main concerns. Um, that's about it.